Hello everyone, today we're going to be taking a look at code coverage. That's right, it's everyone's favorite topic. Now, there's a couple disclaimers here. Uh, if you want to, skip ahead. I'm going to sort of cover what code coverage is. We're going to be using the simple COV gem, which allows you to, to like auto-generate your code coverage whenever your application's running, so that's beautiful. But, uh, what is code coverage? So, in this case, pretty self-explanatory. You have a bunch of tabs here that tell you how much of your code is being covered. What's it being covered by? It's your testing. So the higher these percentages, the more of your code that you're testing. So you can see here, we got 71 lines of our folders controller with 35 relevant lines, and we're covering 35 of those lines. So we have 100% code coverage with an average of like two lines or you know, two hits per line or whatever, which means there's two tests for each line of code, basically. If we come into our folders controller here, you can see it's pretty simple stuff, just a basic scaffold with a couple of before actions. Uh, and I guess the current user being built or builds the folder is like different, but the rest of it's pretty much the same. So why, why would you want code coverage? Well, if you're writing tests for your application, you wanna make sure it works. You don't want to like worry that you missed something uh, and something will break or whatever down the line, this is a good way to do it. If you have 100% code coverage, it means your code is probably not gonna be breaking without you knowing about it. That said, if you have 100% code coverage and you never run a test again, uh, you're not gonna see if you've changed the behavior, so you would still need to run your tests. The other thing is managers frequently fall into the trap of thinking that 100% code coverage is the only metric that matters. This is pretty easy to disprove. For example, this folders controller right here has 100% code coverage. Every line of code in here is tested. We have device users, but what happens if I'm a malicious user? I log into my account to get past the before action, and then I go to like the API and I patch an update for someone else's post, and I change their title to some obscenity. There's nothing in the update method that's checking if the current user is the up is the author of this uh, folder, I guess. So in that case, yeah, you have 100% code coverage, but you have a glaring issue that's staring you right in the face, which you probably wouldn't see because you'd be too distracted looking at the shiny green lines. And that's where managers often fall into this and then they end up having these problems down the road. So that's something to be aware of. It's not the like Achilles heel of, of any sort of software issue. It's still, they're still there out there trying to get you. You do have to be aware of that. Going for 100% is fine. Sometimes you only get to like 90 or 80. It depends on the application. Sometimes it can be pretty much impossible to test some stuff. So that's something else to be aware of. Sometimes the testing itself can be incredibly difficult to pull off depending on the code base. I know what you're thinking. How hard can it be to test a single like index function or whatever? I've worked in applications before where this index method would have been like 6,000 lines of code uh, running a bunch of different threads and you never would have been able to test it because like the thing just didn't work to begin with. So, and I know that's not ideal, but spoiler alert, the, the real world's not ideal. People do this stuff all the time. It's infuriating, but you got to deal with it. So don't expect the 100% code coverage everywhere. That's not really realistic. So what you ideally want is some ratio for what you think is acceptable. In a lot of cases, it's like 80 to 90%, something around that, those lines. So those are just a couple of the caveats there. Uh, the last one I want to point out is, again, we're talking about testing here. Uh, don't think that testing will like solve all of your problems in terms of like your tech debt. So this is great. If you ever mess something up, this will tell you what's wrong. But I've seen tests before that were uh, more tech debt than the tech debt they were trying to like fix by testing it. Good example, that 6,000 lines of code function was tested, but uh, anytime you needed to change the 6,000 lines of code method, the six to 12,000 lines of code test that was trying to test it would then take you eight times longer to fix. You would go in there over and over and over again. You make one small change to the main thing that's being tested, and then you make 30 changes to the test itself because all of these things like touch the database, spin off a separate thread in the test for some reason, and you end up having so much tech debt concentrated in the test itself 
that like ideally you just get rid of the test because it, like the, it's not going to cover everything anyways and it's just wasting so much of your time that if you were to do a heat map of like where your tech debt is it would all point to your testing infrastructure which is like completely counter to what it should be doing but again you get the the really like cruddy old legacy applications and that's something that can happen so now that I've wasted five minutes of time talking about all of the reasons why you wouldn't want to do this, let me just say it is nice to have these numbers here so you can quickly look at it and know that you're doing your job. I just, I, I got to make the scary points because I know there's some junior dev out there who's thinking about getting the shiny green bars so they can prove their application secure and I have to crush their hopes and dreams because we can't let junior developers have nice things. So to actually do this, we're gonna be using the simple COV gem. We just need to do a Rails new video. Hopefully I don't have a video project already. We need to add this gem. We then need to add a quick little config. We need to change this specifically for Rails. Um, and then we'll just go ahead and we'll see what this looks like. It's really easy to set up. Uh, it's like probably, you know, two or three minutes worth of setup. It's not, not a big deal at all. Uh, the main thing is we have to grab the gem. We'll go ahead and copy this and we'll come over to our gem file. And then in our test, we'll just import this gem and then we can do a bundle command in our terminal, just like that. Next, we grab these two lines and we wanna come over to, and this is gonna depend uh, based on which type of test you have. In this case, I just have a basic Rails app, so it's gonna be in test helper. But I think if you have like our spec, it's gonna be in your spec helper instead. So go find your spec helper file. We can then go up here to the top, we can paste this in. This right here will work to some extent. Uh, we should see the coverage folder generate now. And then if we come in here, we have this index.html. Uh, if we come over to our extensions real quick, we can search for, I think it's live server as an extension. If you've never done any sort of web dev in VS Code, this just lets you run like a basic HTTP server. So you can install this extension, come over here, right click on your index.html and click open with live server. This should open it up in Brave. Just like this, it opens up two tabs because Brave is cringe and it doesn't put the colon in front of HTTP. We can go ahead and run this. And now you can see here, this is a little different than the one I just showed you. So the one I showed you had all these tabs for controllers, libraries, mailers, etc. Here we don't have any. And the reason for that is we have to come over to our test helper and after the simple cov.start, we have to put in rails, oops, rails afterwards, just like that. And now if we wait, this should refresh and we have all of our tabs here. So you can see out of the box, we uh, apparently have 0% code covered for all of this stuff. Again, not, no surprise there, there's nothing touching it, but it's not necessarily broken. So you can see 0% isn't really a bad thing uh, because like it's 0% for your application helper, which is just an empty file. You don't really need to test that, but you probably don't need that file at all. But okay, how, how do we actually use this? Let's go ahead and let's do a scaffold for a post with a title and a body of type text real quick. We'll do this. We can come over to all files. It'll take a second, but hopefully this will update. Uh, we can run a Rails test to sort of encourage it to update. Uh, it'll tell us we have to do a db colon migrate. And I think after the migrate, this should hopefully uh, pick it up. So there we go. We can now see that our post controller has 70 lines with only 50 uh, being covered maybe. Uh, so let's go ahead, let's run another Rails test. It shouldn't be, it should be higher than 50. I think we just have to run the test for this to update. So there we go. Uh, and now we can see the post controller has 88% covered. So you can see even the basic scaffold out of the box doesn't have 100% code coverage, but we can go in here and we can check this real quick. And we can see that both of the else statements here don't have the stuff covered. So this is pretty easy to fix, uh, or I guess to, to cover. So let's just do that real quick. We can come into our test our controllers and our post controller. We can come down here to the bottom, we can do a test and we could say, uh, should um, not create invalid post. And we can do a do block. And, and then in here, we can do a quick little test. We say assert no difference on the post.count. So what we're saying here is after this is done, the post count should be the same. And then it tries to create a post without a body and a title. We'll go ahead, we'll run this real quick. We'll run a Rails test. We can run this, we'll see that this fails because it's expecting to, which is to say it doesn't change because if we come into our fixtures real quick for our posts, we can see there's two posts in here. So there was originally two. We're trying to create an invalid post here, which means there should still be two, but it's actually creating it. So what's wrong? Is the test broken? No, the test is working, but our code is not. 
So in here in our post, because we don't want it to create an invalid post if the title and the body are nil, we have to tell it to validate the presence. If we validate the presence and run our test again, we should be able to see that this test passes because now when the, uh, you know, the title and the body are nil, the post rejects it, throws back an error, which means this doesn't get created, which means our post.count doesn't change. If we come in here now to our test, we can see in the else block that we have uh, the coverage here for the else block in our create. So now let's go ahead and let's do another one because we still have to cover our update. So we'll say should not update an invalid post. It'll do a patch for the post URL, pass in the params, both of them will be empty and it'll assert response unprocessable entity, which if we come into our post controller is the else block right here. So it passes back a status of unprocessable, right? So now let's come over here, let's run another Rails test, see if this passes, it should. We can now come over here, scroll down, and we can see this is now being covered. So let's go back and we can see that the post controller now has 100% code coverage. But again, there's nothing really stopping me from coming in here and deleting everyone else's posts because right now there's no authentication. So just be aware of that, that just because the number says 100% doesn't mean that you're actually like doing 100% of the edge cases that you could run into. So that's just, just an aside there that I feel I have to stress so that I can sleep at night. Um, but this is really good. I'm personally using this for an application I'm working on. I've used it for applications in the past. It's a fantastic tool because it's so easy to set up and then you can just have it running here and refreshing while you're testing, which I mean, let's be honest, nobody likes testing anyways. It's absolutely infuriating to sit here and have to write like, you know, 150 lines of code uh, just to test some basic functionality, but ugh, sometimes it's necessary, right? So that's, uh, that's going to do it for this video. Hopefully you at least got something out of this in between my ranting about testing and hopefully I will see you in the next one.